Good evening. This is a JP News special report. We are here at Steinmetz Park in the conference hall where Schenectady Mayor Gary McCarthy is about to speak on code enforcement. First time I've ever been told that. violation uh, uh, 
were being denied access, there is a process by which the code enforcement officer can make an application for a warrant to actually go in and inspect the house and verify whatever conditions are there. Uh, that information is then taken back to City Hall. The information is processed, it's recorded, and a formal violation notice is uh, sent out. Uh, again, that can take an additional week, uh, depending on the timing of when the complaint came in, when we got there, uh, putting the related paperwork together, verifying who the owner is, who the attendants are. Uh, from that, we will uh, send the notice out. In normal compliance period, approximately 30 days, so absent the life-threatening uh, situation. And we do get a lot of compliance from that initial notice. When people uh, put on notice, they'll say, yep, yeah, I'm wrong. Uh, they will uh, take action. And we use uh, also, hopefully, uh, it's uniform is what I call a common sense approach. Uh, you get a peeling paint issue in December and January. We don't expect people to go out and paint their front porch uh, in 30 days. We will work with them, wait for warm weather, uh, depending on the scope of the repairs, also work with them. It may take time to get a couple contractors in to look at whatever the situation is for the uh, property owner to get estimates. Uh, sometimes uh, it'll be a bigger uh, project, you know, they have to look to uh, go to the bank, line up some financing to uh, be able to undertake the work. And we try and work with, again, what I'll call a common sense approach with the property owner to be able to, uh, or a partnership, or mediate the uh, problem. If still <clears throat> after the 30 days and we haven't had any uh, affirmative action by the property owner reaching out, trying to acknowledge the problem, outlining the path for uh, remediation, we will go to court and get a warrant for the individual and actually pick them up and they can be put in jail, brought before a judge, and uh, held into the, uh, again, making some affirmative uh, outline of a path that will uh, result in uh, alleviating the problem. Having said that, every one case is a little bit different, and we're still in a game of playing catch-up, where over the entire city, there are still a lot of properties that are very distressed, a lot of uh, property owners whose motivations and business plan uh, sometimes lack common sense or uh, really any uh, logic. And we try and work through those in a manner that, uh, again, produces results. And overall, we've been very aggressive uh, since I've been there in terms of doing the uh, demolition of the worst of the worst property, and at the same time that we have worked with bankers, realtors, uh, real estate professionals to promote home ownership opportunities within the city of Skag. And it's that balanced approach that hopefully will produce what I look for as long-term sustainable results. Uh, other communities and people told me when I started that, that you should just focus on one neighborhood and make a big impact there. And I've tried not to play neighborhoods off against each other, saying we're gonna do one neighborhood and not another neighborhood. And so we have uh, done uh, activities here in Moose Hill. Uh, there's the house down here in the corner, uh, Van Franken, uh, just the other side of the school that's at abandoned, worked with Habitat, rehab that. They put up another uh, house next to it. Now, that was a eyesore on a very visible street. That took two years to work on the title issues, uh, line it up, actually do the construction, get it back, and now we have a family uh, living there. We've uh, done uh, activity on Eastern Avenue. We've done uh, some work in Mount Pleasant, Central State Street. It's not as aggressive or as encompassing as I would like, but we have to live within the budgetary constraints that the city has and try and map out what is a methodical process where 
We'll get to where we want to go. It just won't quite be as fast as people would like. And we've, uh, again, generally done a uh, pretty good job following up on things. Uh, we've uh, given them part of a uh, project for New York State where we're working with uh, Troy, Gloversville, and Amsterdam, uh, where the four cities are looking at the mechanism to collect data and standardizing some of the terms. When I first came in, in the mayor's office, all the code enforcement uh, records were 100% manual. Everything was hard copy. They, they you know, they'd call and ask for a file. Uh, they'd say, oh, uh, we'll get it to you. So Floyd has that. He's off two days. It's in the front seat of his car. We'll get it back to you when he comes in. Uh, you can't manage the magnitude of the problem we have with that type of system. And I believe it's one of the reasons why we've seen the decline in parts of Schenectady in other communities, because the uh, code enforcement, the record keeping is not uniform, uh, and it's not uh, automated at the level that it should be. Uh, police and fire data in New York State are very uh, well documented. You can pick up a police report in Buffalo, in Syracuse, in Schenectady, and very quickly understand what happened. You get a quick synopsis, you know who the participants were, you know where it occurred, what the time was. Uh, code enforcement, even though we're enforcing the same building code, uh, it's really a national code, the record keeping is, uh, the discretion is really the building inspector. What records are kept and what not kept. And the reports that are required today to be filed with the state are superficial. They're nowhere near the detailed requirements you get from police and fire data. Use a uh, term, uh, uh, the series of terms, vacant, unoccupied, and abandoned. Those terms are used interchangeably within communities and among communities. And so it, there's a wide variance. Uh, the fire department, when they're going to a building, just want to make sure that nobody's in there. Their whole response is, uh, entirely different if a building is occupied or if nobody is there. But abandoned, unoccupied, what does it mean? Uh, there may be nobody home now. Uh, in the winter months, uh, in this area, we get a lot of people who may go to Florida for 90 days, go to a warmer climate, the people are paying the taxes, uh, somebody's looking after the house, they're maintaining it. It's really not a problem property. There's other ones where People have walked away and really just let it sit there where it declines and becomes an extremely negative influence on the, not only the adjacent property, but the neighborhood and the community as a whole. And so hopefully with this project with the, the sister cities, we will help standardize the terms and the format for the collection of data so that it can be shared among the communities in, in a format that will help formulate uh, public policy in a better, more effective manner at both the state and national level. Uh, and with that, I'll just cut it off and we just open up to questions or discussion. Yeah, okay. yeah you mentioned that uh, there's legal avenue for you to take to jail to work with vendors. How often does your office take that tax? Uh, it tends to run in cycles, but uh, we will make applications for warrants on a regular basis. So there are multiple times a month that we will get to that point. Uh, is there anything that's effective for, uh, you, you, will, you get a lot of will, offenders of going back to jail? And stuff? My unscientific evaluation of the process is when we've got the warrant for somebody, the police pick them up and they have to sit overnight in jail. There's a transformation that occurs in their attitude in terms of being much more cooperative than uh, willing to do. Uh, Camille? Um, just out of curiosity, the houses that the city has foreclosed on and they have ownership of, do you hold, yourself, do you hold yourselves to the same standards as you do um, owner occupied and non-landlord? We try and work through that. Uh, the reality is that 
by the time we're doing a foreclosure, it's in the worst of the worst category. And for us, meaning the city, to bring the property into compliance, uh, we do not have the resources to do that. Our general process is to have uh, code enforcement public inspectors office go out and do an evaluation. Uh, it's not a percent uh, guarantee we we'll put an estimate on it. So when we list the property with realtors for sale, we will say that this has a $5,000 code estimate. It has a $10,000 code estimate to bring it into compliance. Uh, and those numbers tend to be on the low side. Bringing a house into compliance, uh, under the technical definition, may not want to be a house that you would still want to live in. But you want to have an attractive, nice, uh, have some of the amenities that they make a home. Yeah, I mean, I'm speaking particularly um, to the point that um, I think you know, uh, the yards and um, hedges and um, overhanging trees and unshoveled sidewalks? We try and mow the grass, put our snap crews out, we uh, mow uh, some of the they're getting grass, do some of the bushes. Uh, we're not doing tree work internally anymore. Uh, we had city staff doing that. We've uh, reverted to using an outside contractor with some retirements that we have skill set internally. So those uh, bigger issues with trees uh, again become scheduled based on is it a high risk thing or is it just something that's unattractive and uh, uh, needs attention. And we try to schedule them and then uh, have them remediated in the time when we have it. How is the lawn scheduling? I'm sorry. How is the lawn, uh, the property that the city owns, how is that lawn Cutting schedule. Uh, in the spring, we never make people happy because the grass is growing too quick for us to keep up with it. By the time you get, uh, by the time you get to cut it, you cut it once a year. Yeah. Well, hopefully, we're cutting it more than that. But there may be some properties that are uh, again on the uh, slower end of the scale. That Franklin apartment building over on the corner of Mason, that's an eyesore every single year. And I know that there's several people that have complained about it. And it's still, every year, it's the same thing. The grass is overgrown, the dumpster is overflowing. How can this be a repeat offender like that? Uh, some of that went through. The history of that building, she had it for a long period of time, you had a very good landlord who changed ownership. That was part of a number of properties in the capital region that uh, had very interesting ownership. Some of those people were indicted uh, down in it. He's changed ownership a couple times since then. And I apologize, I don't know who has it now, but I thought the last time it was actually somebody, Judge Cole, more reputable, had better resources, and that hopefully we would see a change in that this year. But we'll put that on the list again to have uh, somebody document that and to make sure that the citations are up to date. Because a lot of times what happens, we'll go through the process for citing it. When it gets to the point where you get in court and actually hold them accountable and put some leverage in, they will transfer the property uh, to a so relative, the process to process has to start all over. Yeah, exactly, you go right back to square one. Right. And it's extremely frustrating in terms of uh, the city side. We've wasted all that time and effort to uh, get to try and get remediation. Well, as far as um, the city owned trees, it is my understanding that the tree out front of my house is city property. Um, so, I, we have a problem with our water, um, our basement floods, like ankle deep from one side to the other, and we have to rent a snake to snake the roots out. Um, we're not allowed to maintain the tree. The tree has destroyed, pushed up the sidewalk, and it's just getting worse and worse as the roots in the tree are pushing up the sidewalk. So it's my responsibility to fix the sidewalk, but it's, so if somebody comes and, and trips, 
they can sue me because they broke their ankle on my sidewalk, but I can't then in turn do anything because it's your tree that caused the damage to my sidewalk and it's also causing that damage to the my tree collectively. But, it, but well, the city, it, it's a city owned tree. We have called and, and spoken to several people and it's like you get one person and one person and one person and it's just like it's costing us so much money because there's roots in our, you know, in the pipe from this from the street to our house and I worked at Stewart's and I know several of the city guys and they have told me that yeah it's the tree's problem, it's the tree, but I, I, we're not allowed to maintain the tree so I'm just wondering what What's what we're supposed get, to do. Before I leave I'll get the address and we'll have somebody look at it and can do an evaluation of and also, like, um, what are we, what are we supposed to do with these, like, these negligent um, landlords? Because my neighbor is a drug dealer, and the, the landlord knows it. We've told the landlord this, and they know it. And the the kids are going next door, and they're shooting up the um, the guy in the back of his garage with BB guns. They're spray painting the trees. They're riding their dirt bikes up and down the streets with no helmets or anything like that, tearing up our grasses. And we actually care, we, we own our house. We are a young family and you know, we, we pick up our garbage out front and our dog stuff and you know, like we care about our, our you know, area and these people are, we actually just got into a physical altercation with this guy because he is, he kicked the fence down that we put up. So like, what are we supposed uh, to do? We have a police car up here and interview you before you leave. Yeah, and, uh, this is like... <sighs> I'm in the same situation. Okay. Everything that you just said, I'm in the same situation. So what we want to do is we have to have the yeah. information and we'll follow But then if you speak up, then it's like, then they're going, he was going to assault me and I called the police, but my phone disconnected because it's crappy, but I, he was threatening to assault me, so now I don't even feel like I can go outside and my 10-year-old daughter gets, get somebody to like, it's them. just insane. Yes, Do you have a chronic garage sale going on that's like set up like a business where the whole lawn is loaded? Yeah, that's that not kitten angel on the corner of Lennox and Sonic. Sonic. Yeah, it is. Oh, I see that all the time. It's set on my Seneca and Lennox. Once it's set up, and they leave it for the summer. The rain. This, uh, I don't think we cited that one recently. But the rain. There was another one that we cited because. In the, the city code allows you to have yard sales, garage sales, but it limits the number of times. So you, you, can you, you can't have you can't a perpetual a sale. Right. Because they were so out last Saturday. Yes. Last Saturday. Yeah, it's like that's a cheer up. Right. With all the new people coming into the city. With all the new people coming into the city for the casino and everything, and we're just like a half a mile, a quarter mile away. People do come through our streets, and that's terrible. It's disgusting. And then other things, people are parking on their lawns and just leaving the cars on the lawn. That can't be okay. Is it? No. Well, we were told that you're allowed to have one vehicle outside. You're because that lady with the red car was out there. She had that car out there for like 20 years. Right. So that's supposed to be on the lawn. The one you have right the right from your house, you right can have to ours on the oh, right. That's paid. That's paid. Right. 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 No, I, people are just like parked. Sometimes there's plates on them, and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. So where do we report that? Again, uh, you can call the code office. In my personal experience, I used to live in Mount Pleasant and I had, um, my address was 1213 First Ave and the building actually did get condemned. Um, we had called literally probably once a month for a whole year. Um, the guy Joey and Jeremy came into our house. We had um, holes in our bathroom floor, um, peeling paint, our windows, you couldn't get it to go down. We had to like spray foam to get it to like, I mean it wouldn't close, we had to spray foam it so it would close. We had mice. We brought mice in bags down to the city because we caught six in ten minutes. And Joe said that it was just because we didn't like our apartment. And later it was condemned, and I'm sure the building is still standing. So in my personal experience, when you call the city code, they don't do nothing. Well, hopefully that's not the case that's happening. And again, I have to have the specific addresses and be able to look and see what the actual follow-up was or what remediation was done. And if we've uh, failed to do what we're supposed to, we'll take uh, the appropriate action. 
The other thing too that my boyfriend had told me to um, bring up was that we had just paid for all these new sidewalks to be put in, but there's um, black tar that is all over, like on the, the ramp part of it, there's, they screwed it up like so bad when they were paving the road, now the black tar is like all over the sidewalk. It's just like a negligent thing, like we just paid all this money and they're, you know, brand new and they look like crap already. Again, I'll get the address, we'll follow up on it, you know, that's from the contractor that's on site now. Um, I believe so. We're doing the paving yeah, I saw it in the I don't know. They've done the petitions and uh, they're going to submit it and then do the cost estimate to go out to uh, the residents and uh, come back to the city council to adopt that when we actually do the construction. So is there a point of petition going around? My understanding is I thought they had collected the petition to come to the city and so now we will do the uh, design work and estimate. So we go back to the homeowner and say this is going to cost you $100, it's going to cost $1,000 people could make a decision to get more informed in terms of whether they want to get a project to move ahead. Well, it seems like it should be a very good project that the sidewalks are just common and dangerous.
city, but I would expect them to function at a very high level for a very short period of time after being hired. And then the question, do you actually, in these candidates that you're speaking of, are they, uh, is anybody actually an engineer or an architect? Uh, they have the uh, appropriate skill sets for and particular applicants, but there are very highly skilled people who have applied for the position. Pushy chair, built and lunch, and you've got an employee. <laughs> <laughs> He or she, the individual. Sure. People have a junk in their backyard. Now, if the city can't see it, then they can't do anything about it. Is that the rule of thumb? It's the general rule of thumb that has to be visible from the street if we're denied access. Now, a lot of times uh, when you have those situations, it's the adjacent property owner or a neighbor who's making the complaint who will then allow the code enforcement officer to come in and make an observation and be able to document the conditions. Oh, so of you can see it from, if you can come into like our home and look. Uh, next door or, or across the street or something to be able to, again, document what the conditions are. Uh, okay. okay. I, was, I was just thinking that if you couldn't see it from the street, there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes the way things are configured, that is the hurdle that we have to deal with. And then again, you can make an application for a warrant to be able to go in and search the property. But you have to have, uh, work out the criteria and be able to tell a judge why we can't get access otherwise, or what we believe is the condition that's there that needs to be documented and seeking some type of remediation. What is, what is the actual lead time if you get, can't get into a property so you decide you need to get in there and you go for a warrant before that can be, um, before you can actually get the warrant? It, it varies. It could be a few days or it could be you know, two weeks. Yeah, I'm not yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if, it is, if it's that because it's, it, it's how it's processed or... When you send it out there, the request, whatever you have to do, how that's received and how quickly it's done, it's probably not even urgency, right? Because it let, it, you wouldn't be going for a warrant unless you felt it, as Cole felt it was really important to get to that property. So that's kind of urgent. So it might be as much as two weeks. Huh? That's it. <laughs> 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 but again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. 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 Are we going to take a position on this? And not all the representatives are going to take away to next month. And we'll talk about and discuss whether or not Sun as a group will be for or against that. Can you tell us what Sun is? Sun is Connecting United Neighborhoods, all the neighborhoods in the city of Connecticut. And we meet the third Tuesday of each month. And each representative, they go and they talk about what they're doing in their community. And there are certain issues, like when the casino came up, you know, Sun took a stance on it, or the individual um, neighborhood associations will. But and it's open to the public, so if anyone wants to come to the meeting, they can. Any other questions for public? Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan Hawkins is in here, so William, do you want to take his 90 seconds and okay. talk about Rick? Yes, um, as you know, as you all know, and Mayor McCarthy paid homage to my mother who passed away. But we are continuing to uh, combat drunk driving. There's a bill which will deal with confiscation of a car of someone who has multiple offenses of killing someone or injuring someone. And for that, that's a small population, but for it's very significant because some people will just drive and you drive no matter what, and this addresses that very uh, succinctly. So, I have some new letters if anyone would like to 
dinner on the sweater list or see me afterward. Thanks. Okay. And what is the uh, uh, bill number? Um, I, it's by Gary uh, Sunderman uh, Prelo. I don't know the bill number, but he's the sponsor of the bill. Can we do anything to um, encourage its support? Yes, you can contact your assemblyman, and uh, you know, always a phone call is, is always good. You try to uh, garner support for that. But I know it's. I haven't. I, I, I have read subscribed to a service called Leg, Legend Crawler, where we get reports of any drug driving legislation that comes before the Senate or the Assembly. And uh, there hasn't been um, any recent movement on it, but it's really the, the people of the groundswell. And my mother did this in a very laborious way, and now with the advent of technology, I get the report sent to me of who the sponsor is, what the movements are. So it's, it's very much easier to be engaged, but there's so many other things to distract people, it's hard to, to keep the focus. This has been a JP News Special Report.